Father, we want to praise your name. We, um, we want to praise your name and bless your name and glorify your name. And I pray in these few moments that we have together that our hearts would be encouraged and that we would have a better sense of who we are and who we are in Jesus Christ and that because of that we would be able to do everything that you ask us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles, I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. And today we begin a journey, and I don't know how long it'll take us, but we're going to begin a journey through the book of Ephesians. And I'm only going to preach from two verses today because I know that, um, that we have a bunch of students right in front of me, who, in, in this great group of students right in front of me, who just got back from, from um, student retreat. And uh, when Houston Jeffcoat tell you, tells you that he's tired, then there's Houston back there. Uh, Houston, do not fall asleep while you're doing the sound, okay? Uh, but uh, anyway, I want to be good with our time. So I want to tell you why I'm feeling impressed to teach from the book of Ephesians. Um, on some practical levels, there's some great things in the book of Ephesians. By the time we get through this series, we're going to talk about spiritual warfare. That'll be in um, Ephesians chapter 6. By the time we get done with this series, we're going to talk about marriage. Who doesn't want to have a better marriage? Uh, by the time we get done with this book, we're going to talk about um, some really important things, such as how do, you, how do you put off the old person? How do you take off the sins of the past so that you can really live for Jesus in the present? But to be honest with you, there, 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 there is a huge reason, and it's found in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 1 of Ephesians. So if you have your Bible, I want you to open your Bible there. And, um, and I want to tell you a story about the church at Ephesus. Not only as just information, but I want to let it be a kind of a warning to us about why this is so important. The Bible tells us that the church at Ephesus was founded in about the mid-50s, 55 A.D., about 20-some years after the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 18, if you want to refer to it later, uh, Aquila and Priscilla were there, Paul comes there, and they found a church in this city, the very secular city. We act as if today it is the only time we've ever had a secular city. Well, the the city of Ephesus was a Roman colony city. It was a powerful city. It was a pagan city. It was an atheistic city. It was an, an agnostic city. It was a very modern city. They had a theater there. They had an amphitheater there that is big as, as, got, as the Bridgestone Arena. It would seat in excess of 20,000 people, and they would have games and lectures and all kinds of stuff there. It was a pretty modern city for its day. So it's founded about 20 years after Jesus has been raised from the dead. And then this book that we're going to be looking at was written in about 62 to 65. We're not sure, but around there in the early 60s. So 10 years after the church was founded, it reached its zenith. They got a letter like this, and here's the way their sermons would go in that day. You wonder how they preached in that day? Well, one of these apostolic letters would arrive. Remember, they hadn't put it together yet, all these 27 books, and they were going to do that. And the leader of the church would stand up, and he would read from this, this book, or he might read from the Old Testament, and he would explain the scriptures to them, and they would worship and pray and sing, just like we do. And so it's, it's a really good church. It's a, it's a healthy church. But then, 30 years pass. And we come to the book of Revelation. You, you all have read the book of Revelation. It's the last book in the New Testament. It was written in about 95 A.D. John is on the Isle of Patmos, which is a prison island. 
you were in prison, you were put on this island, and he was on this island kind of like the Alcatraz of its day for preaching the gospel. While he's on this island, God has him write a book called the book of Revelation. And in Revelation chapter 2, he writes part of this letter to the church at Ephesus. And here's what had happened in that 30 years. It reached, it's planted, 10 years of growth, and then at 30 years later, John writes this. I have something against you, church at Ephesus. There are some things you do really well, but you have left your first love. And he tells him to do three things. He says, I want you to remember, repent, and return. Remember what you used to be. Repent from where you are and return. And if not, I will come and take my lamp out of your city. Let's get something straight. When Jesus said in Matthew 16 that he would build the church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, that is absolutely true. You can take it to the bank. There will always be a church until Jesus comes back. Can we get a witness on this? But individual churches, that may not be the case. There may be times that a group of people in a particular location are not always faithful to the Lord. And while God is still building His church, He might say, well, that church has left their first love. And I'm going to come. And that's exactly what happened. There is no church, at least the church that was founded in the Paul's day, still in what's called Izmar, Turkey. That's modern day Ephesus. Uh, I have good news to report to you. There is a fledgling church trying to get reborn there. And Muslims are coming to faith in Christ. We don't hear about this much in the, in the news, but aren't you glad that the gospel still works today? Amen? Now, the reason I tell you that arc, the arc of their founding and their peak and their waning, is because I think that can happen to any church. It could happen to us. It can happen to you as a person. Man, you start out red hot for Jesus. The word of the God is planted in your soul. You're ready to go. You're ready to conquer the world. Then you reach your zenith, man. It's, you're, you're praying, you're reading your word. And then all of a sudden, you've been a Christian for so long that you just kind of take it for granted and you stop doing the disciplines that got you to where you are. And you don't, you, you kind of take church attendance casually. And even when you're at church, you're kind of walking the hallways. Instead of in a Bible study class or worship, church becomes a, kind of an inconvenience or it kind of becomes one of the things on the list of many things on your list. We stop reading the word, praying, all those things, and all of a sudden we find out we don't love Jesus like we did when we did over there. So the reason we're going to go through this book of Ephesians is because it, it's going to remind us of two great things. In fact, it's the great divisions of the book. The first three chapters are going to remind us of what it is that we believe. I mean, it's some of the deepest doctrine about salvation and the Christian life is in the first three chapters of this book. I'm telling you, we're, going to, we're not swimming in the kiddie pool. We are going to the deep end of the pool to dive in. So I hope you brought your snorkel and mask. But then in the last three chapters, it's the most practical stuff you'd ever talk about. So I guess what the Holy Spirit is doing here is, is the Holy Spirit wants us to be reminded that what we believe ought to be connected to how we live. How many, can I, can I get a witness on that? What we believe ought to be connected to how we live. Well, it's all right here. The whole book is in the first two verses. You say, preacher, I don't believe you. Here we go. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask three questions, and then we're going to do something really cool to end this service. Okay, here we go. Paul writes, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, 
to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn to your neighbor and say, I can't believe he's going to get a sermon out of those two sentences. Here we go. Okay, here we go. Question number one. Who is writing this book? This is, this is going to be so good. I, you just, you're going to think, it's right here. I'm not smart enough. It's right here in the text. There's three things about who's writing this book. Notice what it says. It says, Paul. Now I'm going to preach on this. Not about Paul, but listen very carefully now. We live in an age where identity politics and critical race theory and intersectionality and groupthink is really doing a number on us. So we got groups. I'm part of this group and that group. And we're, we're evaluated by our groupiness. That's not the way God created us. God created us in His image individually. There is only one Kevin Trump. Aren't you glad that's enough? Can I get a witness on that? Amen. Hey, stop. Stop clapping. Stop clapping now. Now, don't, don't, don't run past these words. The Holy Spirit puts words in the Bible on purpose. Paul. Not Peter, not James, not John. Paul. Paul was who he, who he was. He wasn't anybody else. And his job as a Christian was to be all that he could be in Jesus Christ. I have a word for some of you in this room. Quit trying to be somebody else. Quit trying to be an idea of yourself. Boy, if I, could only, if I were only six foot seven, if I were only this, if I only looked like this, if I only had this, quit trying to be somebody else. You say, Pastor, give me chapter and verse. Here it is, 1 Corinthians 15, 10. Paul is talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He said Jesus was raised. He died according to the Scripture. He was raised from the dead according to the Scripture. And he appeared, and he tells all, he appeared to this, and he appeared to those, and he appeared to this. And he goes, and then he appeared to me. And then Paul says this. This is this. This is my Popeye say. Paul says, and last of all, Jesus appeared to me. And I am what I am by the grace of God. So if you walked up to Paul and say, Paul, who are you? I'm Paul. Where were you born, Tarsus? What's you all about? I'm, I'm Paul. And my, my, my job, my calling is to be all that I can be in Jesus Christ. Christ. Some of you are not comfortable in your own skin. You compare yourself. Stop it. Listen, let us be known as a church. Listen to me. Let us be known as a church that doesn't care in one sense what color your skin is. Doesn't care where you're from doesn't care what language you speak. Right now I'm learning an extra level of Hebrew. <laughs> it's, it's an amazing language. I, but he doesn't care. I'm not saved because I'm white. I'm not saved because I can speak English. I'm not saved because I was born in Missouri, although it's a great state. I'm not saved... Now, if you're born in Texas, you are saved, right? That automatically. Justification by born in the state of Texas. I'm saved because of who I am in Jesus Christ. And let us be the kind of place where people can say, Kevin, not to be all I am just on my own, to be all I am in Christ. And I just want to call some of you. I meet you all the time. You wouldn't admit it. I meet people all the time. 
they compare themselves. Well, I wish I had that, wish I had that. Why wouldn't I have this? I got my nose here. No, God made you just like you are, and he has called you to be you in Jesus Christ. That's just one word. Who's writing this letter? Paul. An apostle. Look at it. Don't close your Bible. It's right there. An apostle was a sent one. Paul, this person who was converted in Acts chapter 9, who was as individual as you could ever get, yet he was sent with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And on top of it, look what it says at the end of that little phrase. It says, Paul, an apostle by the will of God. Now, now, brothers and sisters, listen to me. This is one of the great things we're going to get into. You are a Christian because God has willed it so. You willed it, but He willed it as well. And one of the deep things we're going to talk about when we get into Ephesians chapter 1, it's not you just out here on a limb, kind of hoping on, hanging on. Guess what? While you were willing to believe, God was willing you to believe. Go wrap your brain around that. But it's right here. He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. The reason we believe in the security of the believer is because you didn't save yourself, you won't keep yourself, and He'll take all of His children all the way home. Paul says, I'm not out here on my own as an apostle. I'm out here by the will of God. Let me ask you a question. Who was writing this letter? Paul, an individual. What was he doing? He was an apostle sent by God. Who sent him out? The will of God. Are you that secure in who you are? I am who I am in Christ. God has sent me on a mission. And God has willed it so. You know, um, this past weekend I had the boys all by myself. Keith and Sarah wanted to go on the youth student retreat. Janet is at a family event in Missouri with Avonlea. So at 1030 Friday morning, on my usually day off, I got Judah and Hudson. And I have been with those boys since this morning. It has been awesome. I'm not going to tell you all we did. It's, part of it's not legal, but we did it anyway. Anyway. <laughs> and one thing I've noticed about Judah and Hudson, and they, Keith and Sarah, you know this, they have a pretty strong sense of identity who they are. And that's because they're loved by their parents, they're loved by you guys, they're loved by Paul Paul and Gigi, but they just have a strong sense of who they are. And I want to tell you something funny that happened the other day. We, uh, son, yesterday morning, we go to a playground. We go to a playground, and there's a little girl who you can tell she's not stable. She doesn't know who she is. She's got a pacifier in her mouth. She's walking across this thing. And Judah, a man's man, <laughs> sits down on his haunches gets up, she's sitting there crying, having a cry fit, and uh, sits down on his haunches, this close to her, and just looks at her. And this kid stops crying, looks at Judah, and all of a sudden says, Mom! <laughs> and she comes, gets him, and she, she, I mean, she gets her and comforts her. And Judah stands up and looks at me and says, Paul, Paul, what was that, man? she got to figure out who she is. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> Do you know who you are? Wouldn't it be a sad thing for you to live your whole life and not figure out who you are? Let me close with this, this help. It is very easy to, fig, to connect who you are with what you do. It is very easy to connect who you are with what you do. I am a preacher. I am a bus driver. I am this. And that's okay. We, people, we identify ourselves that way. But you know, one day... I'll retire from being a full-time pastor. I'll probably preach until I die. You may retire from being a this or that. 
Let me tell you one thing you'll never retire from. You can never retire from who you are in Jesus Christ. It can't be taken from you. It's going to outlive your retirement in this life. And the Apostle Paul was confident, not, not, not arrogant, but just confident that who he was in Jesus Christ. Let me give you a second thing, second question. To whom was he writing? Look at that next sentence where it says in Ephesians, it says there, and I love this, it says, to the saints in Ephesus. To the saints who are faithful in Christ. This, oh, this, you hang on now. Paul, the self-identified recipient of the grace of God, who was an apostle by the will of God, was writing to people who were in Christ labeled as saints. Now, we are not the Catholic Church. We will never be a Catholic Church. Catholics have a set of beliefs that are in many areas different than ours. In that tradition, they have what you can reach sainthood. And often you will hear in the news somebody having performed a miracle in various criteria of being a saint. Well, I have good news for you. The Bible says that if you're in Christ, you're already a saint. Now, you may not act saintly all the time, but you are a saint. The word saint here is a transliteration of the one of the meaning holy ones. That in Jesus Christ, we have been made holy, and, and the, the meaning behind that is that we have been set apart. Set apart. We're, 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 we're different. We, we've been made differently in Jesus Christ. So Paul says, I, I'm writing to the saints. This is not the only place, but all throughout the book of Ephesians, listen to this. In Ephesians 1.15, it says they loved the saints. In Ephesians 1.18, they had saints have a glorious inheritance. In Ephesians 2.19, it says we are fellow citizens along with all the saints in the body of Christ. In Ephesians 3.8, Paul says that it was, it was great um, to be the, the saint, be with the saints all of eternity. Ephesians 4.12 says that, that the saints are to be equipped by the ministry of the word. And in Ephesians 6.18 it says we are called to pray for all the saints in the body of Christ. Who's he writing to? He's writing to people who are set apart. Who've been made holy in Jesus Christ. And who are in Ephesus. Now I'm a little amused. When I talk about Ephesus, I think sometimes we commit the sin that C.S. Lewis said of chronological snobbery. What I mean by that is that we often think that we're the firstest. The latest is the firstest, the bestest. That's not true. Did you know that in the city of Ephesus, now he's writing this letter to saints. Where are they located? They're located in a secular city in a pagan city, in an atheistic city, in a Roman city, in a city where idol worship is at the zenith. They're writing where he's writing to saints that are embedded in a place that is far more secular and paganistic and atheistic than Nashville will ever be. And Paul says... God has saints in Ephesus. And then he says, look at that next sentence. To the saints in Ephesus who are faithful in Jesus Christ. Now, I want to be clear about what he means here. He is not saying that we are faithful on our own because we belong to Jesus Christ. The language here suggests that what Paul is saying is that the one who enables us to be thankful or be, to be faithful is Jesus Christ. 
We, we can't do this on our own. So Paul, Paul, an apostle, by the will of God, is writing to the saints in Ephesus who have been enabled to be faithful because of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, we can't do anything apart from Jesus Christ. Well, what's he writing about? My final question. Look at the last sentence. Look at verse 2. In fact, these are the great themes of the Bible, of the book of Ephesians. Notice what he says. He says, grace. Grace. Grace to you. The word grace there is the word gift. We know grace, um, that grace is a gift, unmerited, undeserved, unearned favor with God. We are saved by grace. We are kept by grace. We are restored by grace. We are forgiven by grace. It is all grace. If you're here this morning and you've come with your resume to try to prove something to God, you can't receive grace because you think in your mind it's something you have to earn or deserve. Listen, brothers and sisters, the, the theme of the book of Ephesians in the area of salvation and sanctification is that it's all of grace. All of it. All of it from beginning to end. It is all a wonderful, marvelous, majestic gift of God. If sometimes you're overwhelmed by your sinfulness and God's graciousness, be overwhelmed. Be overwhelmed. Just the other night, I was looking through this and the dawn, the heaviness dawned of my sin dawned on me of how unworthy I am. Listen, I, I don't say, this is not throwaway lines. I'm not making this up. Whenever I say what I'm about to say, I always get somebody that comes to me, oh, not you. I want to tell you, I, without Jesus Christ, I am a pagan. I am a sinner. I am hell bound apart from Jesus Christ. Well, Pastor, weren't you raised in a pre preacher's home? I know your dad. I'm not saved because of my dad. Well, you, you knew the Bible growing up. I'm not saved because I believed the Bible and heard it in VBS and from the pulpit every Sunday. I'm not saved because I'm good because I'm not good. And the other night I was just working this, I was going through all the scriptures about grace and you know what he says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, we're going to get there. It says, for by grace you have been saved and this is not of yourself. Brothers and sisters, let it land on you of how depraved and broken you are. And then let it land on you how God loves you by His grace. Grace. And then notice peace. What's he writing about? Peace. Look at the, there in the text. Look what it says. It says, grace to you and peace. This word is interesting. It's used 92 times in the Bible. And it's not shalom, that's the Hebrew word of it. Shalom means peace or rest. Anybody in here named Irene? Middle name, no claimers. That's the Greek word, Irene. You know what it means? It means to be at rest, at peace, tranquil, unified. I'm, I'm not scattered. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not schizophrenic or helter-skelter all over the place. I, I, I have the peace of God. That's a theme. Listen, always remember this. It is always grace first and then peace. Grace first and then peace. Always. Read it in all the New Testament. It's never in the reverse order. It's never peace and then grace. And so that's what's the problem with some of you. You want the peace. You want to be settled. You want to be tranquil. You want to be at rest. And you skip the grace. You're still milling around taking the bags of the past and the junk of your childhood and the junk of your growing up set 
them down. God's grace has enabled it. Set them down. Lay them aside. Take all of that junk and lay it down at the foot of the cross and you will experience the peace of God. Let me give you a Bible verse. Here it is. Philippians chapter 4. You know what it says? Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, let your request be made known to God. Prior to that, you know what he said? He said, don't worry about anything. Don't worry about anything. And the peace of God will take you through. And then he gets into that verse 9, and he goes, what's the peace of God? Here it is. The peace of God is none other than then not a full bank account, not the perfect job, not the perfect kids, or the perfect marriage. The peace of God is none other than the God of peace himself. What's Paul writing about? Notice what it says in verse 2. Grace and peace from God our Father. Stop. Do you know we have a good, good Father? Do you know we have a good, good Father? We have a great Father. We have a Father, Matthew 6, 9, our Father who in, is in heaven. Pater in Greek, Abba, Daddy in Aramaic. We have a good, good father. And you know what our good father loves to do? Our good, good father loves to love his children. Our good, good father loves to pick us up and embrace us. Our good, good father loves to meet all of our needs according to his riches, which are in Christ Jesus. We have a good, good father. We have a good, good father who loves us enough to pull out the board of education and discipline because... Because the Bible says, whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. Mm. We have a good, good father. What's Paul writing about? Grace, peace, a good, good father. Look at the last phrase. And the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, Kyrios. He's the Lord of all. He's the Lord of over every regime. He's the Lord over every dictator. He is the Lord of the universe. He is the Lord of lords. He is the King of kings. Jesus. Jesus. He is God come in the flesh. His earthly name. Jesus is the one who has been for all eternity. But in the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, that He might redeem those of us who are under the law. Jesus said in John 8, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus said in John 8, He said, before Abraham was, I existed. Brothers and sisters, I was out the other day in a park and I saw the Jehovah's Witness set up and I wanted to walk over and I said now you do know that Jesus didn't begin to be born didn't begin to exist at his birth Jesus has always existed but because of the purposes of the father to save a people for himself beginning with Israel and now the church he wrapped himself in human flesh and came on a rescue mission give him the name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins Matthew 1 21 What's he writing about? The Lord, the Kyrios, the Lord of all. Jesus, the one come in flesh. Christ, the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophets. Hundreds and hundreds of them. So here it is. What's the book of Ephesians about? Well, it goes to who's writing it. Paul. Not Peter, not James, me. And I am what I am by the grace of God. 
What am I? I'm an apostle. I'm a sent one by the will of God. So this man who knows exactly who he is is writing to who? Saints in a secular city that needs Jesus. And what's he writing about? He's writing about grace and peace and a good, good father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You know who you are? Now, the reason I ask that is I close. Our world needs the Lord, doesn't it? Our world needs Jesus. Our city needs Jesus. Inglewood needs Jesus. So here's my drop the mic quote. If they need Jesus, and we're supposed to tell them about Jesus, how can we tell them about Jesus when we don't even know who we are in Jesus? Hey, I want to invite you to follow Jesus. Well, okay, tell me about it. Well, I'm just trying to figure it out. I'm not sure who I am. I'm sure who he is. No. So here's my call to you as we go through this book. We're going to learn a lot about salvation. We're going to learn a lot about how to live. But I hope and pray that God will build in you such a strong sense of who you are in Jesus that when we live for him in this world, People can take notice, not of us, but of the one who has defined who we are. I was um, in some place really important a lot long ago. I don't get to go to those places very often. And I was with somebody really important. I have no portfolio in this place. I have no, all I got is a credential I got in. And we're walking down the hallway. And people would look at me like, Okay, I know who he is, but who are you are? You know what my answer was the whole time we went down? We'd pass every security checkpoint, and they'd look at me like, who are you? And I was afraid to tell them who I was because they'd probably kick me out. And you know what I did? I'm with him. That got me through everywhere. We go to the next one. He, oh, yeah, good to see you. They'd look at me. They'd look me up and down. Don't look like much. I'd say, I'm with him. Okay, go ahead. And, uh, listen, I'm going to tell you what. When you're going through life, and Satan and the world points his finger and says, Jesus, I know. Who are you? You know what you need to say? I'm with him. I'm with him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your word. And before I finish this prayer, Undoubtedly, there may be somebody in this room who is not sure of who they are in Christ. And my invitation, the invitation is very clear. So I want to I wanna be in Christ. I want to be a Christian. I want to follow him. So, Pastor, how do, you, how do you begin that? How do you do that? Well, the Bible says that if we will turn from our sin and confess Christ as Lord, believe in our heart, we'll be saved. Have you done that? This morning, you can do that. Turn from your sin. Turn to the Savior. He will forgive you, give you eternal life. He is working his will. Now I want to speak to some Christians here. You know Jesus, but it's been a while. It's been a little while, and you've lost who you are. You're like this church at Ephesus that Somebody could write to you and say, hey, hey you, you've lost your first love. What, what happened? I don't know where you got off the road. 
I don't know what exit ramp you took. But uh, you have forgotten who you are in Christ. And you're not as excited about Jesus as you used to be. So my invitation to you, dear brother and sister, don't let the jadedness of life, the cynicism of this world, keep you from enjoying Jesus and knowing who you are. And maybe this morning, you just right where you're standing, you want to come, you can, during this time of invitation. You can come along with those who need to trust the Lord. You might need to come and say, Lord, I just need to fall in love with you all over again. Maybe you don't have a place, a church home, to live out this thing called the Christian life. And even though we're individuals, we can't do this by ourselves. And so I'm just going to ask that in just a moment, when we stand and sing, I want to be clear about what you can do. You can step out and walk down that aisle, take my hand. I'm going to ask you why have you come. And if you come to give your life to Christ, we have people who will open the word share with you and pray with you. If you want to come and pray or have somebody pray with you, you come. Or if you say, I need a church home, this is it. You come and say, Pastor, this, is, this needs to be my church home. Now that I've given you that instruction, that clear instruction, I'm going to finish my prayer. And after I pray, we're going to begin to sing. And while we're singing, you come. Let's stand together. Father, as we sing, would you call them? Would you call them? By your spirit, would you call them? We can't come unless you call. So, Father, by your Holy Spirit, call them. Call them to salvation. Call them to remembrance. Call them to membership. Call them, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing together.